So our first moderator today is Kat Packer. She's the um, head of the Department of Cannabis Regulations in Los Angeles. She was appointed by Mayor Garcetti and she's a very strong uh, advocate for social equity programs and she's the most important person in LA right now. Kat Packer. <laughs> Good morning. Oh, we can do better than that. Good morning. My name is Kat Packer. I'm the executive director of the Department of Cannabis Regulation for the city of Los Angeles. Uh, it's a joy to be here with you this morning to talk about the state of retail and distribution. I uh, want to let folks know that uh, Joe Devlin and I, uh, Joe sitting right here to, uh, to my left, uh, he and I just got back from Denver uh, last night. We were a, a part of a delegation that went to go check to see what was going on in the city of Denver in the state of Colorado. Uh, and, and one of the things that I most appreciated about that trip uh, is that although Denver and the state of Colorado have been doing this, uh, this cannabis legalization and regulation for six years or so, uh, I looked to Joe and I said, we're not that far off. Uh, and there are uh, issues that we are tackling that the city of Denver and the state of Colorado have not even begun to scratch the surface. Uh, and so I'm, I'm very excited to be able to share and hear from panelists. I actually appreciate being in this position and being able to moderate, so thank you, Susan. Uh, I'm normally the one who gets asked 300 questions a day, so this will be nice for, for me to get a chance to uh, be the one asking the questions, but I have an excellent group of panelists here today who are going to uh, share information about their experiences uh, and, and what the last nine months has really meant for uh, the state of California in terms of retail or distribution. Uh, I, I, I do want to ask my fellow panelists to take about one to two minutes to uh, introduce yourself, let folks know who are here, uh, who you are, uh, and what you do uh, as it relates to retail or distribution. We'll start with you, Joe. Good morning, and, and, and thank you, and thank you, Kat, and um, thank you, Susan, for inviting me. Uh, my name is Joe Devlin. I'm the Chief of Cannabis Policy and Enforcement for the City of Sacramento, and what that means is, in a nutshell, um, I've been responsible for putting forward uh, all the policy recommendations for the Council as it relates to the uh, adoption of our Sacramento's regulatory infrastructure. Uh, we also um, do all the processing and, and, and permitting um, for the local cannabis businesses. Um, in addition to that, we also do the enforcement side of things as, as, as well of, of, of legal cannabis businesses. Um, I've been in my job for about 18 months now. Um, prior to that, I worked for the city council and helped, and helped create the office and create the position. Um, and then I liked the job so much that I applied for it, so. Thanks, Joe. I'm Eric Spitz. I'm the founder and CEO of C4 Distro. Uh, we started this company in 2016 uh, with the idea of helping the cannabis industry move from backpack to briefcase, is what we like to say. We have 35 people who focus their attention servicing producers and retailers in Southern California. So we cover 260 plus stores, all the legal stores in Southern California with a field staff of about 20 people, uh, a back office infrastructure, as well as a warehouse staff and a set of drivers. And what we are trying to do is help the industry really get to a place where other industries are, which is a fluid and working logistics path and supply chain. And uh, uh, I have experience in the beer industry. I operated a media company and have been starting companies for the last 20 years. So this is really for me a coming home to an industry that is in a wonderful spot. I look forward to talking to the panel and Kat and really helping all of you guys understand what we're facing so that we can share and grow together. 
Thank you, Eric. Um, my name is Jared Kylo. Um, I'm the president of the United Cannabis Business Association. Um, we originated here in Los Angeles working with pre-ICO Prop D compliant retailers. Um, we now represent about half of the retailers here in Los Angeles and about 25% of the retailers throughout the state. We've kind of moved into a state legislative committee um, as an organization. Um, our organization represents retail almost exclusively, but we also have five distribution partners. We felt like um, understanding the supply chain was going to be really important important uh, in moving through regulations and having you know um, good relationships with the people who are going to be delivering products to us uh, and since I think most of the people in my organization as retailers have had a lot of experience with cultivators throughout the years because they've been operating in Los Angeles for up to a decade um, I also own the higher path in Sherman Oaks which is just in the valley here um, and it's been nice because of my experience in Northern California running retail up there and also kind of being part of the medical marijuana task force up in San Francisco. It was nice to come to Los Angeles and really try to find the organization that really seemed like it, it was necessary to move um, what was kind of a chaotic, uh, I guess, regulations in LA to something a lot more clear and concise. And, um, and also with the, with the help and leadership of CAT, it's been, a, it's been a nice experience. I mean, you look at Los Angeles having more retail licenses than any other municipality. So it's a heavy lift to be here in Los Angeles. It's also a heavy lift because we have a lot of illegal operators or at least people who are unregulated. So trying to find that balance has been um, a, a, a Herculean task for everyone in Los Angeles. So I appreciate everyone coming out today to try to listen to some of the hardships we have as retailers and distributors, but also some of the conclusions and solutions we have. Um, but I think some of it's going to take um, a cohesive group to kind of fight for the same things and for us to come up with really good solutions that kind of help everybody. So that's where we're at. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am pleased to be here today. My name is Pamela Epstein uh, with my fellow panelists, and I am the owner and founder of Greenwise Companies. We have a consulting company uh, and a law firm, <clears throat> so they work together to help operators along the supply chain. Specifically, we work with dispensaries and distributors about how you navigate this complex and ever-changing regulatory framework that we have here in California. And a lot of that comes to the bedrock foundations of good contract drafting, agreements, how people interface together, because as we'll talk about, the best time to go through the difficult terms and to plan for what may happen uh, is when everybody gets along and has the same end game. Uh, which is to be profitable and successful in this very complicated market. So I enjoy being able to work with operators through the process. We take them through the local licensure all the way to state licensing, compliance, moving forward into compliance, auditing businesses um, so that they're able to understand and grapple with what the regulators want to see from them. So it'll be an exciting conversation. I'm glad to have both people from the... Uh, jurisdictions here as well as operators because that gives you a dynamic flow of what everybody needs to, to be dealing with today. So uh, my name is Adam Hijazi. First of all, thanks uh, Susan and the State of Cannabis for putting this awesome uh, event together. Um, so I'm on the board of directors for the Long Beach Collective Association. Long Beach Collective Association consists of all of the legal, uh, legal operators in the city of Long Beach, which is retailers, distributors, cultivators, manufacturers. Uh, we've been around since 2010, so at the time we were advocating for medical cannabis uh, when the city first bought its ordinance forward. Uh, we have been through a very tough time to find regulation, uh, working from the community up to find consensus with city and different departments throughout the city and uh, community leaders to see what's the best way to bring regulation in the city of Long Beach. So uh, currently, uh, we have about 150 different applicants in the city, and, and our membership is growing, and uh, the issues that we face here in the city. Uh, I'm also uh, the owner and the managing partner at Long Beach Green Room and the station, uh, the first uh, legal cannabis uh, facility again in uh, 2017 is when we opened. So I'm thrilled to be here with the panelists and look forward to the conversation. All right. So as you can see, we have a, a great uh, variety of stakeholders who are here. Uh, I, I, what I want to ask the stakeholders uh, here today is to uh, feel free to be completely transparent. Um, I, I really 
uh, besides from moderating this panel, want to use this as an opportunity to really learn uh, from experiences. And I do think that it's great that we have folks that are operating in different jurisdictions. So I guess I want to start off by asking uh, for Joe, uh, Jared, uh, what does retail operation look like in the city of Los Angeles? What does access look like in the city of Los Angeles or in the city of Sacramento? Uh, what does the retail space look like? Uh, just generally. Well, thanks for asking, Kat. Um, I think I think the thing is now is uh, there's been a lot of extinction events that have been happening with regulations, and it's been pushing a lot of um, everyone in the supply chain to uh, kind of the brink of their own pocketbooks or venture capital, um, and just kind of the whiplash we have from regulations being swung from a completely unregulated industry to the most regulated product ever in California history, and to have us do that in a small amount of time um, has been has been difficult. And and you can see that there's kind of been an emboldening of the black market because the gap between prices has been so vastly like expanded now that you know you're looking at 50 to 60 percent difference in costs and there is that kind of benchmark where people are willing to pay a little bit more for a regulated tax product but i think we've gone way beyond that at this point and we're pushing people back to the black market and it's not just pushing consumers it's not enticing people who are in the black market looking for a space in the regulated market to allow them to say there's a comfortable place to go if you really take the risk and the money and the effort to make sure you get to regulated and so that gap has been widening so much now that every single tax we have um, at the state and local levels I mean the city of Los Angeles has a 10 percent gross receipt tax on 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 recreational use well, now 80% of my business is recreational use. That means there's a 10% tax on 80% of, uh, of my users there. And it's mostly just because most people are letting their, their prescription kind of just fall by the wayside because there's not a lot of incentives. So I would ask everyone at this, at this level of Kat and Joe to really look at how are we going to entice people back to the medical model? When is that conversation between a patient and a doctor really going to happen? Because this may be a recreational use, but there are a lot of medicinal uses that you use kind of recreationally. We have two beers before we go somewhere because we want to go out. Well, a joint is kind of the same way that we look at it. It's a way to relax, and it is something medicinal to take away stress. And if we don't have that conversation with doctors and we pull further and further away from the medical model, I think we really are going to get distant away from what our real needs are, which is we have a product that can kind of balance between medical and recreational pretty easily, but the balance is swung. And so I think we really need to kind of entice people back into that medical model and I think lowering taxes to um, to medical users and trying to draw more of those prescriptions back because I mean as a business I'm seeing that uh, that there's a thousand other dis illegal dispensaries and delivery companies in LA that have this firm advantage over me as an independent business and so until we lower taxes to a you know an equitable way to kind of compete with the black market I think the pendulum has swung too far in the direction of over taxation and we're gonna have to look at this taxation kind of rolling out over three to five years because I don't know a lot of people who have been in this industry this long who are feeling like wow this is great I'm this is the most successful I've ever been now that that's like <laughs> So I want to feel that way, and I want to tell people in the black market that that's the way that I feel. It's the most successful I've ever been, but it's not. And I, think, and I think we need to really look at each other and go, how do we lower these costs of becoming compliant, and how do we lower the barriers to entry back into this industry? Because we've got 50,000 growers and users and people who have created a huge amount of infrastructure already and we're not utilizing the infrastructure that's already been built in this economy of cannabis we have to use it to its full capacity otherwise we're destroying lives families and infrastructure that could easily make tax dollars for us so I think that's where I am as a retailer and as I look at my group of retailers and we're not going well look at all the greatness that we have here we're mostly looking like who's illegal and I hate to feel that way because if you've been in this industry long enough, you know that you've teetered on that edge of legal and illegal the whole time. That's what the, that's what the system is kind of set up. So 
We're not drawing people over that, over that fence to say, come into the regulated light, let all the, let all the tax dollars go back to the municipalities who put a lot of time and effort. I mean, we've been working with LA for a decade now, trying to make sure that we got a license, and we worked through limited immunity forever. And so to have a license now in LA and to not be on a fair and level playing field with other businesses is a really difficult place for a lot of retailers. Thank you. Uh But before you respond, Joe, I just want to make a note. You're going to hear me say something that I, I, I said yesterday while we were in Denver. Uh, I, I want to make a point, and Jared, I, uh, I hear what you're saying. We want to make sure that folks don't have to compete with the illicit market. Uh, just a, a note about terminology here. Uh, just as we've continued to move forward and change our terminology to say uh, cannabis instead of marijuana, uh, it's, uh, I feel as though it is important uh, for me to articulate uh, that we are at a moment in this industry where it's no longer appropriate to use the term black market to mean criminal market. Uh, so that'll be my ask to the panelists as we move forward. Uh, when we mean, when we say black market, uh, we mean criminal market, we mean illicit market, we mean unregulated market. We should use those terms uh, instead of using uh, black to mean criminal. So I'll make that ask of my panelists. I'll make this ask of the room. And, and we'll catch ourselves using it. We'll, we'll have to work through this. We'll find other words that are no longer appropriate. We'll, we'll work through that process. I should have said it first. Uh, but uh, thank you, Joe. Thank you. Um, so you're right. Taxation is, is a huge issue. And, um, in fact, I got maybe into a little bit of trouble um, saying as much to um, someone that maybe didn't want to hear it. Um, that works for a different um, regulatory agency. But tax we do need to have a robust conversation around taxation. Um, and I, I think for me, one of the things right now I'm trying to, what I'd like to understand, I actually just had a conversation with a, a, a market research company, is, is how can we understand who that consumer is and where is that tipping point? What is the price elasticity of cannabis But before they go, you know what, you know, to the heck with it, I'm just going to go call my, my buddy who I've been buying cannabis for for the last 20 years and I still can. Um, so we need to understand really that consumer and kind of what is the tipping point and, and, and maybe have getting some data around that I think could help foster that conversation in a, and drive that conversation in a meaningful way. Um, the retail kind of situation in Sacramento is we've had 30 dispensaries since 2012. Uh, we essentially have had a moratorium on, on that uh, since, since that time. We kind of backed into our dispensaries. They started popping up all over town. And council said, don't move. Um, and then through federal actions and some attrition, we ended up with 30, and it's stayed at 30. I think our the more dynamic uh, part of our retail is around delivery at the moment. And one of the challenges that we're facing with uh, delivery is that while we've had delivery and it's existed in, in our community for a number of years, it hasn't existed in a form that looked like a business, right? There wasn't a brick and mortar. And so when, when we created a registry to try and bring these um, um, uh, existing operators uh, into the legal framework, they registered with addresses that they weren't operating out of, that maybe they, they couldn't have, um, that they'll ever be able to really functionally operate out of. And so that has presented a challenge, and we are muddling through it. We have 65, 70 applications for non-storefront delivery uh, in Sacramento, um, and we're gonna continue to kind of muddle through it until we, you know, figure it out. And my hope is that enough folks survive um, that transition um, and, and don't, you know, become extinct. I, I want to ask the same question to Adam. Uh, what's happening in Long Beach? So, well, Long Beach has been pretty interesting. Um, in 2010, the city of Long Beach uh, brought forward an ordinance 5.87, which originally uh, legalized for the first time retailers and cultivation, one of the first cities to do so. 
Uh, recently, uh, then there was a gap from 2012 to 2017, about five years of no cannabis whatsoever. Uh, now, uh, coming back this time around, um, we just literally got recreational cannabis in the city of Long Beach probably around three, four weeks ago. Uh, yeah, so that was, uh, that, you know, we were hoping to start at the beginning of the year, but it ended up being in July, so that was uh, a huge issue to not be able to let people back. You know, we were denying people entrance into the facilities. Uh, right now, uh, a lot of people are just going through the process. I think there's only about five or, there's about 10 or 11 uh, retail facilities that are actually open in the city of Long Beach currently. Uh, they're working through the process, the fire department, the building department, the electrical, mechanical, plumbing. Um, so it, it's been moving along. Uh, the city of Long Beach has been pretty friendly and as proactive with helping businesses as much as possible, considering the fact that they're doing this kind of for the first time on this level. Um, so that's, that's been awesome. So now facilities are here. Uh, now in regards to uh, patients or the consumers, kind of echoing a little bit of, you know, Jared was saying, you know, taxation is an issue. The illicit markets has always been around, but uh, we need to be able to give a viable option to uh, patients and consumers to be able to walk through these facilities. And, you know, the taxation and, and where the taxation kind of started, it, it, and a lot of the policy that you saw is emotional driven policies. These are policies from regulators, legislators. Uh, when they looked at cannabis, they're thinking, oh, let's, let's put a sin tax. It's really a tax, it's a high tax. If we're gonna have it in our, in our city, let's, let's tax it at this late, let's at least. And thinking that everybody was gonna come and these, has, these high tax dollars, but I think there was a governor's report that came understated in regards to the amount of tax because there wasn't a true understanding of the economics and me mechanics behind uh, the cannabis consumers and the taxation. And I definitely welcome that conversation and there should, some, should be something that, that happens in regards to that. Um, so that's really important. Um, in, in regards to illicit markets, they're gonna be here. They're here right now. Uh, I think, you know, again, Jared was mentioning, is giving the opportunity for people to get involved. And a lot of the times when the city sets, cities set up these, they're so limited and they're so tough to be able to get some of these licenses. So being able to streamline some of it, I mean, you have facility, you have cities that they do CUPs, business licenses, development agreements, three, four different kinds of licensings to be able to get one license, you know. And then when you're done with that, you have to deal with the BCC, that food about, you have to deal with all these different departments. So it's kind of tastes like a little bit like nuclear waste right now. Everybody's very, you know, eyeballing and regulating it uh, heavily. So I, I think it's gonna normalize, and it's really about the perception. And that's really the most important thing is, is the, people are scared, well, who's gonna get in? Who's gonna be touching this? Where the more majority of people are everyday people or big businesses uh, that are getting involved. So it's a little bit of kind of what's going on. And Pamela, time. I wanna ask you a question. Uh, Adam was just uh, discussing the challenge and bureaucracy of going through the licensing process. Uh, with your consulting firm and your law firm, how have you been able to help folks navigate uh, what seem like very turbulent waters? Yeah, I, part of it comes to know your business and interfacing with the city and helping to educate and being a source of constant information. What he's gonna talk about with regard to taxes is for a greater part, these cities are going through drafting tax ordinance and ballot measures and what that language looks like. And it's important to be engaged in that discussion, especially if you're an operator, uh, to be able to say, this tax is going to drive me out of business. This tax isn't gonna have the ROI to your city that you think it's going to, because if I can't operate, there's no influx of capital. And then being able to work with them on the language, as we're starting to see moving throughout the state, is the flexibility for, by resolution, the cities to be able to change the tax levels. Because to have to go back to the voters is very difficult. So if you have these conversations as you're moving forward in the process, you're able to do that. I think the other thing for applicants to do, or operators to do, and we talk about this a lot with our clients, is your application is your promise to the city. So if you're working with a consultant or an attorney, know what they're putting in your documents. Make sure you're sitting and reading, for example, your community benefits plan. If you're going to make a promise to a city that you're going to give them, let's say, 20% 
of your gross sales receipts because you're in a competitive application and you're like, this is what they want to hear. And this is going to make me look successful, especially if it's a development agreement. And then you come up short. These are one year permits. Everybody should remember this is not a vested right. You have to go back, work with your city, tell them what you've been able to accomplish and do. And if they don't trust you or believe you because you're making unrealistic promises to them, then you won't have a business and somebody else you're going to be an acquisition target or you're going to be extinct. Because the way that I look at it and we look at it is that you've got three real options coming into 2019. You're an acquisition target, you're going to survive an acquisition event, or unfortunately, you're going to be extinct. And the best way that you cannot go into door number three and survive one and two is to have a good plan and to be able to navigate that process and to be able to have an open conversation with the, those that you are engaged in business with. You operate in a city every day. And you're going to come across issues that you're going to have to go to planning and building. And you're going to have to go to the business license division. I talked to Emily uh, at the city of Long Beach on behalf of my clients that are there on a constant basis. And it's an evolution. We need to bring in capital. So we have to add an owner. How do you go about doing that when a lot of times we've seen throughout these jurisdictions a prohibition on transfer? And that means that you can't change ownership. How do you grow and scale as a business if you're improving a building and you can't bring in capital the same way other businesses would? We've been able to change the ordinances by having conversations with people like Joe and Kat and explaining those very real world business problems and being able to manipulate that language. When you look at sensitive use receptors, as I'm sure all of the operators are familiar, that process is difficult. We are just going through that in Culver City for a client. It's a really interesting use. You go in, you apply, and as I'm sure Jared and Adam can tell you, you look for a piece of property, you're looking for a unicorn, that it's in the green zone, it's zoned correctly, it has enough power, it has parking, it meets all the requirements, you go, you apply, you get a business license, and then you have to go through a CUP. What if a sensitive use receptor either accidentally or on purpose, unfortunately, opens up next to you? If you don't set the game board, if you don't work with the city and say at the time of the submission window, set the game board, set where the green zones are, if a use comes in, they understand that the potential for a cannabis business is there. Because if you do it at the date of receipt of application and you have a 30, 60, 90 day application window, all of a sudden these operators have invested tens of thousands of dollars and they're buffered out overnight. Or if it's at time of issuance and you're going through a CUP and we saw this in Lemon Grove, somebody popped in a daycare center, paid them $10,000 to file the paperwork so that somebody else no longer could move forward in that process. If the regulators don't understand, if the cities don't understand that this is what you're grappling with, they don't know how to respond to that. So I think overall, the most important is to be informed, be engaged, work with a good lawyer, work with a good consultant, but know what they're doing and direct them. Don't let somebody say, uh, I think Amanda said it best yesterday, put a windmill on top of your building because it's gonna make you more attractive or solar and then not be able to do it and it's not feasible. That's only shooting yourself in the foot and, and souring a relationship with a city that's moving into regulation that is difficult. I wanna ask uh, this question specifically to Eric. We uh, heard Jared mention these mass, ex mass extinction uh, moments uh, either on January 1st or July 1st. Uh, what has that meant for uh, a distributor? What has that meant for distributors across the state of California? So we look at this market as a consumer market. So if you would look at the cannabis industry as a consumer market, the way we do, we see four market segments, uh, flower, concentrates, edibles, and wellness. 
Uh, we, we use wellness as a catch-all category for the topicals and the tinctures and the stuff that doesn't fit into the other categories. So we know how much of the current volume is going through each of the categories. What's been fascinating about these extinction moments is July 1st caused a complete reset of the flower category. A complete reset. What do I mean by that? I mean that the stores were empty to the point where if you had a previous brand in the old regime, you still had to start over. Just like everybody who is starting over with a new brand in the new regime. Everybody had to learn how to package. Everybody had to learn how to test. Everybody had to learn how to make sure that everything was childproofed. Everybody had to learn how to go into the store with the right COAs, the right proof that this product is correct. And we learned that over the six month period. Some of the brands learned that, some of the brands didn't learn that and needed to start learning it in the new July one, post July one environment. So that's what we're seeing and it's really fascinating because inside of this new emergent time in the flower space, you're gonna start to see some real innovation. And I see that innovation coming over the next 90 to 150 days. You're gonna see brands that you've never seen before that are gonna blow your socks off. From a branding perspective, they're gonna start to look like brands that you recognize from the alcohol world, from the consumer package world. The boxes are gonna be pretty. There's gonna be a backstory for the brand, so you're gonna know where they came from and who's behind them and what their sourcing is and why they believe what they believe about you and you joining as a consumer their tribe. So that's coming and it's really exciting. So I wanna uh, ask you another uh, question, uh, Pamela. What has it looked like for businesses to work with one another, to set up these agreements, to set up contracts, to ensure that there are products on the shelves? Uh, and I'm sure there was disruption uh, when we went through uh, these various moments, January 1, 2018. I know in the city of Los Angeles, uh, there was a lot of disruption. Uh, so I, I want to hear from Pamela first, and then uh, Jared, I'd like to hear from you as well. Uh, yeah, Kat, great questions. Um, I think that we've seen with our operators that legacy operators and early adopters tend to have the most difficulty here because they're used to saying, this is somebody I trust. They're used to saying, you know, I didn't put things in writing because that was evidence and that was evidence that I was teetering in this, you know, uh, almost regulated, limited immunity, whatever it is that these times had. And so it's really coming around to this sensibility of what is traditional regular business. Um, we have this conversation a lot. What do other heavily regulated industries do? We're not reinventing the wheel in cannabis. We are simply adding another widget to a commodities market. And so contracting is the cornerstone and the fundamentals of good business because there are provisions and there are things that are coming. As we march towards ever closer full legalization at the federal level, what does that mean? That means you can get to federal court. When we're talking about negligence claims and we're talking about products liabilities claims that are coming, there are things like trouble damages that happen when you can get into to a federal situation. So uh, they're looming, they're waiting. We've seen Prop 65 lawsuits that are coming. You've got to be ahead of it. You've got to know that when you're a retailer, if you're contracting or you're a manufacturer and you're contracting to get flour, how that flour is getting to you. Where's the custody and control? Who is in control of it? Who is responsible? If there is a, a raid, an accident, a uh, hijacking, who is responsible for this product? Are you covered from an insurance perspective? Who, where does it go? If you're using a transport only licensee, they can't hold custody to the product. So on one end of that transaction, somebody's covering when somebody else is moving, physically moving the product. When you're talking about our QA, QC procedures here in California, protect the consumer. That's what they're driven to do. So the point of testing is right before it gets B to C. That's when the distributor's responsibility. 
That means if you're a man, if you're a cultivator and you're selling product to a manufacturer where that product may get contaminated if it's that it's clean when it left the cultivators, but by the time it gets to the manufacturer and the manufacturer doesn't test it before they manufacture it and all of a sudden it gets concentrated and at the end of the line it tests dirty, whose responsibility is that? That's a contract term. That's where you need to be penning out all of these different levels of how you interface together as a supply chain. Making sure that the excise tax is collected and paid. You are responsible from the state agency's perspective for everything that you do and everything that it goes along the pivot points on the supply chain. So you're gonna wanna know that everybody else in that line is doing the same thing you are and the best way to protect yourself and your business is through these agreements. And it's a difficult lift. It is not easy, it is expensive. You're going to start to see the prices coming down. Working with a good lawyer, you get a, um, what I'd like to say is a suite of agreements that then you're just tearing off of. So if you're a vendor, ask a distributor to send you a distribution agreement don't read it, read it yourself, have your lawyer read it, go through what red lines you wanna do, and then have a meaningful conversation. We're all figuring it out, that's the great part about this industry, is it is community-based. We've, most of us have been here, we're working through these issues together. Use it as a collaborative framework, but please don't cut the fat when it comes to your legal representation and putting down on paper where responsibilities, liabilities, and warranties go. Uh, when we're talking about packaging and labeling and where that little California universal symbol needs to go and the primary panel, um, this is my plea. There are four things. I know branding, we just talked about being very expensive. Your logo is not one of the four things that needs to be on the front of your uh, product, I, I, I'm sorry, I understand I have this conversation several times a day. It isn't. It's the net weight in U.S. and foreign metrics. It is the universal California symbol, which should be in scale size to your logo. It should not be the tiniest thing with your big logo. And then you've got to name your product. A vape cartridge is not correct. It's a cannabis vape cartridge needs to identify the product name, and it needs to be on the part of your product with the ordinary course of business that a consumer sees. I'm sure that Jared and Adam go through this all the time. When you're checking these products, do you take them into your store? Do you run the risk of the BCC coming in and somebody saying, it, they're getting easier and easier to identify. I don't know if Jared and Adam want to weigh in, but these days I walk into a dispensary, you can zero in on a non-compliant package much more quickly. So this isn't the time to, to play around, it's the time to contract, put all the terms in writing, make sure you understand what they are, evidence that, that you're meeting all of these other ancillary uh, regulatory protocols, and then you can go about the business of being profitable and being ready to survive into 2019. That was... Uh a lot of great advice that was shared. Jared, I want to ask you, um, I communicate with Los Angeles stakeholders on a regular basis, and one of the frustrations that I heard very early on uh, when we started our process uh, from our existing medical marijuana dispensaries uh, was that they were concerned uh, because of our phased licensing approach that they weren't going to be able to carry uh, Los Angeles-based products on the shelves. Uh, and so I know a lot of those relationships have changed over time uh, because folks don't have licensing yet. Uh, what has that meant for your retail business and your uh, existing relationships with other either cultivators or manufacturers in the city of Los Angeles? How has that changed over time? I think we took a couple of steps back as being the leader in the world with production in Los Angeles by not allowing the producers to really continue the relationships of which they had had for well over a decade and supplying all the consumers of Los Angeles a lot of the products that they wanted. And by cutting off that supply chain, you had to now jump outside of Los Angeles to find relationships. And I, I mean, I'm uniquely um, 
I guess, benefit from coming from Northern California and having a lot of those relationships with direct with cultivators. I know that where I live, it's one degree of separation from a cultivator. In Southern California, it's six degrees of separation. And so to find that direct connection with someone you can trust or someone who has a product that you can tell what the consistency is or know that there's going to be you know, a consistent amount of products so that your customers can become very aware of what products you have and expect them to be tomorrow, that got cut off. And a lot of the people who had spent branding opportunities in LA to target that market, when they didn't have the ability to grow or produce or manufacture or distribute inside the city, I think it, I think it took us back a little bit. But in the grand scheme of things, you're looking at more retail licenses than any other municipality. So we had to start somewhere. It wasn't just this free-for-all. There's already been a free-for-all in Los Angeles for a long time. And so when you have to draw the line somewhere and say this is our starting point and this is our foundation, a lot of people got cut out. And I don't know how to say what we could have done different to make sure that more legacy operators were able to enter into, uh, into the industry, but it had been illegal to grow off-site of a non-Prop D compliant location for five years. So. It's been known that that has been an illegal place to be, but in this industry of allowing the legacy people a first opportunity to enter into the regulated market, I think we waited a little too long in Los Angeles to really allow those legacy people an opportunity to supply their own community. And I think we will build really fast in Los Angeles, and there's going to be some unfortunate legacy people who are not going to make it. We are not a normal business. I mean, when I look across the street at one of the largest Ralphs in the country, and I know that I pay almost the same kind of business taxes they do with my $5 million of revenue and their $200 million of revenue, and we have the same business taxes, we are not equal businesses. So, so we have to look at ourselves and go, yes, we want to operate like normal businesses, but we're not treated like a normal business. There's no other group that has even above a 0.027% like retail tax as a business tax inside the city of Los Angeles. So to say that I'm paying close to 8% on average between my 5 and 10% gross receipts tax for a local tax, like we're not a normal business. And being taxed at 50 and 60% and then, then at the end of the year having my accountant say, wow, your 280E taxes, well, you're going to owe another 400000 You're like, whoa, I did not necessarily budget for that. And so how do you budget for an unknown of all these taxes? And since we have swung the pendulum so far and are not giving any relief to businesses just trying to be good operators, um, it's just been a very difficult time. And I think Los Angeles has a good opportunity to really show the strength that we have as a community and rebuild together. Um, but we're still waiting for fire to come and do inspections. So we don't know what the attrition rate of the fire department's gonna be, where the building department and planning is gonna be. And since a lot of these variables are still up in the air, there's a lot of, there's a lot of insecurity because we've invested, like my whole life savings is currently in my business. I don't have a savings anymore. And because it's all right here and what used to be a nice return on investment, now it's, it's a maybe. And that maybe is becoming more and more difficult to say, who is willing to take their life savings, put it into this industry again, and start from scratch, because that's kind of what we're doing. We're starting from the beginning. We're, we're, well, we're well regulated. We're well taxed. I just want to make sure that those taxes and, and representation really go to how are you effectively helping our businesses make it in this particular new regulated industry? How is the state of California doing enforcement and really helping us? How are they lowering state taxes so that we don't have to have a huge burden with 280E on the federal? Can the state help us out? Can there be some places where we, we do give to get? I mean, the, the state didn't collect a lot of taxes, and I don't think it was because they didn't think there was a lot of sales. The velocity of sales were not there because there wasn't enough retailers, there wasn't enough compliant product, because they created a system that bottlenecked, and that bottlenecked lowered the number of regulated sales. Those number of regulated sales reduced our taxes, and now it looks like, well, the industry's not moving as fast as it could. We're not utilizing all the infrastructure that has been created over the last 25 years plus in California to the biggest benefit for the most taxes in return. We've gone too far to regulate and we're missing out on a lot of those legacy people who, who need more than just six months to a year to transition. I look at some of the power plant companies and they're given 25 years to adapt their coal burning power plant to a natural gas one. 25 years. I'm given a year, 18 months, six months to adapt, and sometimes it's two weeks to adapt to a brand new regulation that just got dropped yesterday. 
that is not the kind of transitional time this kind of infrastructure needs to really be efficient. So we're here with, uh, you know, many of the folks in this room are either uh, cannabis advocates, cannabis policy advocates, uh, cannabis businesses, and this conversation involves many different stakeholders. Uh, to include all of those folks, community members, uh, law enforcement, health officials, uh, and, you know, I, I think it's going to take, and we've seen that it's going to take a collaborative effort for us to move this process forward. Uh, as a regulator, uh, we deal with the other side of the coin of all of those uh, same challenges. And so I want to hear from uh, Joe, what have been some of the biggest challenges in trying to uh, either manage uh, the retail and distribution space? Uh, what have been the concerns that you hear from community members or elected officials about uh, retail operations? Because as a regulator, uh, we kind of sit in the middle of all of these different stakeholders uh, and translate and, and share information and try and uh, move the needle forward. So what has that process been for you? What have been some of uh, your biggest challenges? All of them. <laughs> um, I, I find myself kind of in the, uniquely, I think, in the middle of the public, the elected officials, and the, and the, and the industry. And, and I think I understand the, the, the 360 view on all, on all of this. I, I do think taxation is too high. I mean, fundamentally what we're trying to do is apply economics to the regulation of, of, uh, of, of this substance. And, you know, economic principles still apply no matter how much you want to ignore them. And so um, we do need to be sensitive to that. Um, I think that really is um, really the collective, the, the totality of it, right, for, for the elective uh, from from the elected's perspective, I think they look at this and they're like, okay, uh, public voted for this, but I know that they're not really 100% supportive of it because when I go out and have a community meeting, everyone's upset that there's a dispensary being planned f near my house or someone wants to open up a cultivation facility, you know, three miles from my house, and I'm pretty sure it's going to ruin my neighborhood and ruin my property values. Um, and for the... Uh, the internal organizations of the city, we also face our own challenges. We, as a city, uh, began taking applications for cultivation in the month of April uh, a year ago. We didn't have, um, you're required to get a conditional use permit in the city of Sacramento. We didn't have a, a single hearing, I think, until July. And it wasn't because we just sat around going, well, we're just gonna put that on the bottom of the stack. It took three months for planning staff to figure out what they were evaluating, right? I mean, this is all still so new for everyone, and I think that that is the, the I think the biggest challenge is that it's all so new for everyone. It's, the regulations are new for the industry, becoming like, and I don't mean this like in a, in a, in, in, hopefully it's not taken as an offense, but becoming like a business. Like, I know a lot of legacy actors, and yes, they were a business, but, they weren't really in a business. If you're in the cannabis industry, you're in the compliance industry. It's really what you, what you are in now. Um, but it's also new, I think, for everyone. It's just, um, it's just a lot. I think everyone kind of feels like they're drinking out of the fire hose. And um, uh, I get to, to kind of see it, see, it, see it from every perspective. Yeah, I, I just want to echo Joe's sentiment. Uh, you know, part of the challenge in the city of Los Angeles is that, you know, folks want access to licensure. Uh, but in order for folks to even have access to licensure, there needs to be a licensing program. Uh, and licensing programs don't uh, pop out of thin air. Uh, they need to be created. Uh, and so for a city of 4 million people with 15 different elected officials and 96 neighborhood councils, uh, there were a lot of different uh, opinions to consider. And I... You know, a, a, lot, a lot of the folks who are in this room are on one side of the spectrum. Uh, most folks kind of fall in the middle of the bell curve. Uh, and then you have, you know, folks on the other side that are completely opposed. Uh, but I do think that it has been difficult for elected officials and public administrators to deal with this issue. Uh, 
cannabis is sexy for the folks in this room, uh, but as an elected official, uh, cannabis is not that sexy. Uh, and you know, no one wants to uh, hang their hat on something that's not guaranteed. Uh, and the success of this industry uh, and the impacts of this industry are well known. When's the last time we legalized cannabis? Uh, you know, this is all new. And so I, I appreciate folks like Joe, uh, like other elected officials who have uh, taken leadership on these issues because it can be a real struggle. Uh, and I think it's gonna be important for the industry to actively participate and identify uh, those champions uh, at local, federal, and state levels because uh, you know, th those are the folks who are going to be able to move the needle forward while everyone else has their, uh, either their heads in the sand or they're sitting on their hands uh, Pamela, it looks like you want to Kat, comment. Because uh, Kat, you made a great point, and I think this is really important. I served previously as a special city attorney for the city of Hollister, drafting their regulatory program and their ordinance with them. So I have a unique lens of looking at it from the, the city's perspective and from the operators. Be involved. Like Kat's saying, these programs don't happen overnight. Most of these... Uh, uh, staff at cities never thought cannabis was something that was going to be part of their everyday rhetoric that they would have to understand, let alone draft um, an ordinance. So be that active participant. If you want to operate in that city, go in and meet with city staff. Go in and meet with the city council members. Offer them a suite of options. Sometimes we'll put together a package of the ordinances and the different languages that we thought for our operators worked the best and then proposed draft ordinance language. I have drafted ordinances for several cities across the state on behalf of clients that gave a cheesecake style menu of operations is what we like to call it. We did a whole hog ordinance um, and we really focused in on what was important for the operators we represented and provided it as a baseline tool for discussion for that city or that county to use, it is well received. They want to understand. If a city's dipping their toe into regulation and Cat and Joe are great, it's a good opportunity to provide a, a meaningful information so they understand your process, they understand what you're gonna go through as a business, they understand how your business functions since it is different and new. Don't miss that opportunity, it's critical. If you come to them at the point of the application and you've never showed up at a meeting and you've never been engaged, you're just a name on a piece of paper. Now, the converse is that is don't go in and think because you're providing these things you are guaranteed a license, you are not. Um, don't go in and because the mayor is your friend thinking you've got nothing to worry about, this is you in the bag. That's not it, this is a purely providing information and shepherding the process and being um, a source of, hey, you know what, these regulations came out, I don't really, what's going on there? And updating them as that process unfolds. I think other cities, just to add to that, I think other cities coming online is gonna take some time. There's still political risk to this. Um, you look at how uh, Prop 64 fared in, in a lot of these um, counties, um, and a number of these cities, and, and it wasn't 60-40. It was a little bit closer to 50-50, and there's not a lot of electeds that are willing to go out there and say, hey, you know what, 50-50, that's good enough. I'm gonna lead the charge on this one and risk my political career on it. So I think it's gonna take a little bit of time. But what is gonna delay that is gonna be poor experiences by cities, well, like Sacramento and Los Angeles, if, you know, if and when things go wrong, you know. We've had a very positive experience so far, and, and I don't ex expect any, um, but you know, bad operators or poor operators or people over-promising in this space and under-delivering just as a, as a whole, um, I think potentially uh, slow down that process. All right. And then uh, I do want to allow for uh, Q&A. If we have an opportunity, Susan, will we be able to do a little bit of Q&A? All right, so we'll do about three questions. Are we gonna have folks uh, come up? And uh, Susan has a mic, so if there are folks who have questions for the panelists, please raise your hand. Uh, and we'll actually, I think we have folks lining up, so sir, if you could come over here and line up. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Kat, and great panel. Thank you, everyone, for participating today. Uh, my question is for Joe Devlin. Uh, my name is Jackie McGowan, K Street Consulting. I work a lot with Joe in the city of Sacramento, and I love that the topic is about over-promising and under-delivering. Um, we had uh, a, a city council meeting back in May, um, and it was really hard for me to pick my jaw up off the floor when it felt like an arbitrary number of $140,000 was plucked out of the sky in order for High Times to have an event, and that was money that was promised to community organizations. And um, they also promised a certain tax um, obligation to the city, um, and they have a new event, October 31st, that they started selling tickets to that they didn't get local approval for. So uh, that item's been removed from the agenda. The obligations have not been fulfilled. And I want to know from you, um, how does that harm the rest of the industry in Sacramento, uh, given that uh, we have a two-part problem now? Now that $140,000 mark has been made um, for any other event that wants to be thrown in, in the city of Sacramento, and we have uh, a very big event organizer that has failed to uh, own up to their obligations. Yeah, thank you. So I, that number was, um, thank you for that wonderful question. Um, it, it, the, the, the date of the event, I think, is October 25th. Just, um, so don't show up on Halloween. Um, but I believe that that number was proposed by, by, by High Times. That wasn't a number that was pulled out of um, by the by the council, um, they did make good on their tax obligation to the city. I don't know about their um, other commitments to um, to their community partners. Um, so, I, I I don't know. It I think does leave a little bit of a kind of bad taste in in in, in the council's mouth, if you will. I mean, we got really jammed the first time they said, "Hey, we want to have this event pretty much tomorrow." You know, can you figure out a way to, you know, to, to have a, a, a grant us local approval? And we did. It was the first one in the state. And we said, okay, you know, hey, don't do that again. Can you, like, give us a little bit more advance warning? And they didn't. Um, and so I, I don't know what's going to happen with that event. I don't know if they're going to get local approval or not. Uh, I think these types of events are going to be treated as a little bit one-offs. I don't think it reflects necessarily on the cannabis industry in in Sacramento because they are they're they're transitory. Um, they're not part of our kind of local cannabis community, if you will. Um, so I don't think it reflects poorly on Sacramento's cannabis industry, um, but you know maybe a little bit on the industry as a whole. Hi, my name is Sarah Grew, and I wanted to tell something we see in a lot of other industries um, is producers and, and growers having direct access to consumers. Um, if you're in Sonoma County, you can go to Cowgirl Creamery. You can see them make cheese. You can buy some cheese and bread and carry on. And you can go to an orchard and you can buy a pound of apples. You can go to a vineyard. You can taste the wine. And we don't have that opportunity in cannabis yet. Um, we did see a step in that direction with a bill this year allowing for temporary retail licenses for small and mid-sized producers or farmers to get a temporary permit to then be at an event, like a big, you know, cannabis event, an Emerald Cup, or, you know, the farmer's market kind of thing. Um, so I'm curious what you all think of this sort of, you know, how we can bring this into the fold with cannabis, if you did or didn't support that bill, and why? Uh, yeah, I think, it, like we talked about yesterday, when we couldn't consume or we had a problem with consumption on the boat uh, here on the Queen Mary, the ship, uh, correction. You, these are things that need to be discussed. The event license, the event organizer and the event license that the BCC created has some fundamental issues. Uh, we saw two bills going through the legislature, 2641 and 2020, which we're still waiting for the governor impatiently waiting to sign some of those bills. Uh, it's an active and ongoing conversation. I think it should be a legislative priority for next year to figure out how we can get back to the cannabis culture that was the foundation of uh, how we got here was this direct interaction with, with brands to consumers. But that's an agenda. You have to make those position points. When the regulations came out and the draft permanent regulations came out, it worked with clients about putting better language in 
Um, these are real concerns. They're affecting everybody. And I think if we see 2020 move forward, that's a step in the right direction. Do we still have a long way to go? I think so, to get back to where we were, right? We wanna get back to stasis in a regulated way. We have to do it pragmatically. I think it's a, a real concern for retailers um, to think about if they're gonna be the sole retailer for an event you got to pick your um, classification for licensing because all of a sudden you run everything through your dispensary for a big event. You may have said, oh, I think I'm only going to make X number of dollars to pay my annual fee. The way the fee structure works right now, you would pay a penalty and then half of the other fee. So it's something that we got to think about and work through. Uh, it's a long game. But if we see some development, that'll be great. Unfortunately, for now, we have to live under the regulations as they are, and doing those types of events are hard. And I Eric, see a lot of them. Eric, I think that you, uh, did you have something that you wanted to add? Yeah, I, I think there's a little bit of the cart before the horse uh, going on here. If instead of looking at apple orchards, as the comparison set or even uh, cannabis back in the pre-regulated environment, look at things like beer and alcohol, where you're not allowed to just roll up and do a beer event without getting a permit. Uh, this is cannabis. So the idea that you want to have a, sorry? Sure, and you can go to a micro license facility uh, in Los Angeles, there are several of them, and you can buy what they're making there. There are places called Show Grow that are showing you what they're growing and then they're making them. And, the, and, and so the idea of doing it is there. I think what, what people are reacting to, it hasn't flushed through the system. So there aren't a lot of those, just like there aren't a lot of microbreweries where you can walk up and do it. That evolved over a 10 or 15 year period. I think there's clearly market demand for it. Um, Back to my comment of it's a lot for everybody. It's going to take a little bit more time to, I think, really kind of flesh out, like, you know, how that would actually work and really get to a place where, I mean, the legislature is going to pass it. Really quick. So, completely, that's, I mean, as cannabis culture and having these facilities and as other wineries and Sonoma and all that stuff, but what's really kind of important to understand is. Okay, where we're at right now in regards to your question, but what did it take to get to this position? So for example, here in the city of Long Beach, we did two ballot initiatives in the city of Long Beach and we had to reach out to the voters to talk to them. The whole entire intent was we're talking about we want to bring in retail stores to allow safe access to patients. So we're sitting here and we're having, you know, we're talking about safe access with retail. We're going the voters prop 64, they're thinking retail, retail, and right now potentially to come in and open up other sources without some sort of understanding the functions of how that's gonna, I think it, it, it's eventually it's gonna go there. But you know, we've been telling the, the public at large that hey, we're trying to get safe access, retailers, maybe brick and mortar deliveries and, and other options, but it's also what we've been educating the public on and then now to come uh, potentially without really vetting it and, and bringing in different licenses that would go direct to the farmer's market or, or whatever it is, I think it just requires more time. Um, this said. Uh, first of all, my name is Matt Wilson. Um, in the eyes of Kat and some of you, I might be looked at as a guy in the illicit market. Uh, this is about, first of all, I think the mistake is we're making alcohol the same as uh, cannabis. We're looking at it, even though they find out alcohol is really bad for you. So maybe we should do some adjustment there. But my second, my real question is about phase three. Me and my wife have been operating a non storefront delivery for the last year and a half, and we've been helping a lot of people, majority medical, majority in their 50s and older. My question is, what do you tell somebody who's been in this industry, like most people, in the illicit market uh, for the last eight years, helping farmers bring down medicine to distri uh, distributors, putting their life in line, have guns pulled, and then maybe to not have the rug pulled out from underneath their feet when phase three happens. So what can you tell somebody who's right now operating and serving people and who's here today to try to get some more information? Kat, this direction this is to you. And just the fact that we're all here is beautiful, by the way. It's awesome. So the first thing that I'd say is that you shouldn't be operating. Uh, we have a system that's been set in place by the uh, state of California, by the city of Los Angeles. Uh, my job is to administer and enforce those rules. Uh, so that'd be my first statement. The second statement I'd say is good luck. Uh, and I want to work with all operators who are coming to try to be a part of the process. 
I get questions every single day about phase three. Uh, I was getting questions about phase three in January. Uh, and the truth of the matter is, is again, you know, folks want priority processing to licensing, but if there's no licensing system, if there's no licensing infrastructure, it would be a disservice for me to open phase three today uh, without proper infrastructure in place. Uh, I want to see the long-term sustainability and viability of this industry. I want to see this industry succeed. I want to see this industry be responsible. And it's my job to administer and enforce the policies that have been set in place by our mayor and our city council. Uh, so I hear uh, in your chest your frustration. Uh, and what I tell you as a regulator is that you should not be operating. Thank you. Thank you. If I could just add to that, I'm in the same boat, right? Like, and, and I don't exactly know what phase three is. I don't know. <laughs> but, but, but I, I've got enough problems. Um, but, but look, I mean, like I wake up every day with like a little bit of pressure, feeling somewhat responsible, maybe a lot responsible for essentially the rollout of cannabis in a city that I love. Right, that's, and, and you got politicians, you got neighbors, you got industry, like all poking at you. And, and like, we're literally in the middle of, of all of this. I've had, a, I've had some really cool jobs, I've had some really hard jobs. This is the hardest job I've ever had in my entire life, <laughs> by far, right? And like, and yeah, I've had some hard jobs. Uh, but we're, we're in the middle of all of this. And I think what, I, at least I'm attempting to do is you know, make sure that that the decisions that we're making are not arbitrary and capricious. That there's a, that there's a a clear path forward that is really accessible um, to the existing cannabis industry to make that legal transition. To make sure that those markets are accessible to the consumer, because at the end of the day, that's ex that's what is going to make this this whole thing work and make it sustainable. Um, and there are gonna absolutely be people that are gonna go extinct, that aren't gonna make it. Um, there are gonna be people that are gonna come into this industry that everyone in this room is probably gonna hate, right? Fill in the blank, giant corporation. They're coming. Um, but, um, you know, as one of the things that, again, we're trying to do is make sure this is accessible for the people that are here, help them make that transition, and provide open markets to the consumers um, so you all can be successful. Since I didn't get an opportunity to discuss AB 2641, and I know that question was for the elephant in the room, so um, I would love to address it um, if we have a minute. Sure. Um, the problem with that bill from our standpoint was you're talking about four events a year, four days a year, looking at the amount of sales that could happen in those four events per year, we were looking at around 20 to 25 pounds being sold by a farmer. If you're a 10,000 square foot farmer and you're producing about 1,100 pounds a year or anywhere from 700, we were looking at a small proportion of your harvest going into a direct to consumer sale. A lot of people were saying, well, what is the economics behind that? Well, currently, as a retailer, you would have to have 24-hour surveillance over every single transaction. You'd have to hold it for 90 days. If you transfer from a cultivator to a distributor, that product cannot be redistributed back to the cultivator, of which it would have to be destroyed. There was a lot of problems inside the, uh, the kind of, uh, I guess, temporary retail permit that the cost of compliance was not looking like it was going to be beneficial than what it would take to get the amount of margin that would be made um, at that direct to consumer sale. Plus that bill only allowed you to sell at, at, at fairgrounds. Well, there was currently only 19 available in the state. So we're fighting for 19 locations with four events a year to sell 20 pounds as a cultivator. Well, from our standpoint, the cost of compliance was too high and the bill was kind of a ruse to say, we wanted to make sure you had access, but at what cost was that access going to be there? 
Um, that's why as an organization we supported 2020, which is a bill that allowed retailers to continue to operate in their position. It doesn't mean they're taking a 50% markup of your product. It just means they are, at, they are just the fundamental people doing the transaction. So a lot of the economics of this didn't pan out. A lot of the people saying that this was something they become accustomed to over time to be able to sell direct to consumer. Well, you can't go in a parking lot in Arcata anymore and set up a 10 by 10 pop-up tent and sell direct to consumers anymore. You'd have to go to a fairgrounds with, a, with, a, with, a, with an actual event, pay the dues, pay the fees, and pay the cost of compliance, and the, maybe the liabilities of bringing too much product to that event that you would have to destroy and not give it back. That was what was, it was posed to a lot of the people that this was going to help smaller farmers, but the economics of what went into that wasn't really dis disclosed, I think, to a lot of group, and that's where our group looked at the economics of it and said, you know what, there is a bill that expands access and expands the number of locations. There's another bill that limits the number of locations and limits retailers being able to kind of do their job, which is what this was for. There's 22 license types. Did we need a 23rd? So I just want to uh, take a moment to thank all of our panelists. I think that this has been a very interesting and enlightening conversation. So could we give our panelists a round of applause? I think this morning's uh, panel is very indicative of the fact that we have a lot of more work to do. Uh, we've made progress. We're nine months in at this point, and I look forward to working with all of the stakeholders and the panelists to make sure that uh, we do it right uh, and that we make sure that this is a sustainable and viable industry here in the state of California. Thank you.